<laughs> the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> it's my pleasure, Mr. Speaker, to rise to speak to, as my colleague mentioned, everything but the kitchen sink um, motion today. Um, I intend to give very brief remarks to um, the last matter to do with the uh, farmers of Western Canada, but speak mainly to the second matter about Canada's energy sector. Um, on the matter of inter-switching, um, this is of course a problem that the previous Conservative government did nothing to resolve in the long term, just kept having these temporary uh, continuance. They did extend uh, the inter-switching distance to, I think it was 120 kilometres. Uh, I've talked to the grain farmers of Canada and to some of the growers in Alberta that I know well, including Humphrey uh, Bannock. And they said they're pleased um, that eventually, if this law is in place, to extend it to 1,200 kilometres, but deeply disappointed that yet again the government is letting the August 1st deadline pass without any change. And it means that the inter-switching reverts to the 30 kilometres. And this is going to put our shippers at extreme disadvantage, particularly those who are in the process of negotiating uh, the shipping of their crop this fall. So indeed, uh, we support the fact that this should be expedited and we need the Liberal government to take measures to make sure that this interim arrangement extends until uh, this law is passed and enforced. So Mr. Speaker, on this second matter, um, the allegations by the Conservatives that the government is attempting to phase out Canada's energy sector by implementing what they call a job-killing carbon tax adding additional taxes to oil and gas companies, removing incentives for small firms to make new energy discoveries, and neglecting the current jobs crisis in Alberta. Now, Mr. Speaker, what they are neglecting is what the reality is of what the energy sector is, not only in Alberta, not only in Canada, but across the world. In fact, where most of the investment is shifting to is the renewable energy efficient sector. And this party, the Conservative Party, just absolutely refuses to understand that the energy sector includes more than oil and gas. Now, contrary to what they assert, Mr. Speaker, it's not the recent moves by the Liberals to address climate change that is the problem. It's the complete failure of the previous government to address this global challenge in any credible way, or to take any measures to support the diversification of the economy, including in my province of Alberta, including towards supporting the development and expansion and deployment of renewable energy and job creation in the energy efficiency sector. The Conservatives committed to reduce greenhouse gases and then set targets. They then repeatedly promised to establish a regime to address the single largest and growing source of carbon emissions, the oil and gas sector. And they proposed a cap and trade regime. They even issued a discussion paper on offsets. But Mr. Speaker, None of it ever materialized. They did, to give them credit, propose a shutdown for coal-fired power by 2050, unless the greenhouse gases were reduced, investing millions of taxpayer dollars in carbon capture and sequestration. The Alberta companies completely backed away because of the high costs and questionable efficacy of the technology. However, that target did not address the growing health impacts of the coal-fired power sector well documented by the Canadian Medical Association. To their credit, the NDP government of Alberta have moved forward the date of decommissioning of coal-fired power. And that was in response to these concerns with the health impacts associated with the toxic emissions from coal-fired power. The federal government eventually followed suit and have also moved forward the date. Alberta has also announced regulations to reduce methane emissions. This government again mirroring, but have delayed, Conservatives did nothing about methane, despite the fact that methane emissions are far more powerful in causing climate change even than carbon. The Conservatives' tirades about the carbon tax are growing tiresome. Many of the provinces have already initiated programs to reduce greenhouse gases emitted in their jurisdictions, including a carbon levy imported, impo imposed years back by the then progressive Conservative government of Alberta and a carbon tax imposed by the government of British Columbia. Contrary to the allegations by the Conservatives that addressing carbon kills a fossil fuel sector, we need only look to the booming sector in BC and in Alberta. Instead, the Conservatives should be supporting calls by many 
for additional measures to the carbon tax by the federal government to actually address climate change. Mr. Speaker, Environment Canada is projecting that based on the policies they have in place, the country was on pace to miss its reduction target for greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, pumping out at least 30% more than promised. And that is based on the meagre Harper targets that they have continued to stick by. There is in fact a problem with the carbon tax. As many credible sources have pointed out, it's not sufficient on its own to deliver on the national reduction targets, let alone the commitments made in Paris. While a number of nations have managed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, Canada continues to increase ours. The government should start by expediting action on its promise to the G20 to phase out and rationalize inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. That's been recommended not only by Canada's Auditor General, who in his 2017 spring report has criticized both the Departments of Environment and Climate Change and Finance for failing to even complete a review of the perverse incent subsidies in place, let alone prescribe a plan and timeline to phase out. This could go a long way to ensuring a more level playing field for investments in the renewable energy sector and energy efficiencies. Secondly, while the budget lists a myriad of measures to support deployment of renewables and increased energy efficiency, for the majority of those measures, any spending is defrayed over the next several elections, almost zero allocated this year. The release of federal money supporting provincial and territorial initiatives under the bilateral agreements on green infrastructure and the Low Carbon Economy Fund are similarly postponed. And why not restore the eco-energy retrofit program, as my colleague mentioned, to match provincial and municipal programs that would help reduce home energy costs and costs for small to medium businesses and help to reduce the concern with the coming carbon tax. It's time also, Mr. Speaker, to follow the United Kingdom model and infuse some accountability in the climate program. It is important, as our party has recommended since I've been elected eight years ago, to enact binding reduction targets and to establish independent commission to advise, monitor and report. The problem, Mr. Speaker, is there is this list of initiatives that uh, the various ministers wander out to the public and to industry and talk about, but there's no certainty what they're actually moving forward on. And the first glimpse that we get that they might move forward with programs is we see this listing in the budget documents. But then when you turn to look at the budget document, you see that, in fact, zero dollars allocated this year. And that includes, Mr. Speaker, two programs to help isolated and northern communities to get off diesel. Now, that would be beneficial both to the health of the community and to reducing greenhouse gases. So one small measure, regrettably, again, delayed. Very, very important, Mr. Speaker, that we get off this rant about the carbon tax and instead come together to, come to put pressure on this government to actually come forward with a wholesome, fulsome program to actually meet not only their meager targets, but targets that they should be meeting to do a fair contribution to the world reduction in greenhouse gases and to meet their Paris targets. It's not enough to uh, send the, the uh, Environment and Climate Change Minister around. She spends a lot of time meeting with uh, members from uh, the European Union and so forth. I think it's time for her to come home and actually start implementing some of these measures that will actually benefit Canadians, reduce their costs for energy, and actually move us towards a cleaner energy economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question uh, and Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my uh, colleague's uh, intervention today and her uh, position in making it well known uh, as, a respect, as it uh, pertains to a price on carbon. Um, I'm wondering if she can comment a little bit about Canada's position globally as it relates to the price on carbon. My understanding is that Canada is actually well priced in terms of not being amongst the highest and also not being amongst the lowest. And globally that will put us in a very good position as it relates to um, our, abil our ability to be competitive. I'm wondering if she can comment on that. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to serve on the Environment Committee with the Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that the issue is the price on carbon. I think what's more important is to compare Canada to other nations 
in the actions we're taking to actually reduce greenhouse gases. Mr. Speaker, there's recently been a report comparing us with the United Kingdom, and it's showing the trajectory of Canadian emissions rising continuously still, and the United Kingdom emissions falling. And why is that? Because they've actually put binding targets in law, and they have an independent commission that holds the government's feet to the fire, allows the public to actually know what's going on. My concern, in all honesty, Mr. Speaker, is, is that as the price on carbon rises, there will be greater pushback by the public or small business on being able to pay that tax. That's why it's all the more important for the government to bring forward additional parallel measures that are going to support our, our homes, our families and our communities to actually reduce their, their energy use and thereby reduce emissions. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my friend for, from Edmonton Strathcona for focusing so clearly on the difference between meeting the Paris Agreement, which is to hold global average temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature above what it was before the Industrial Revolution, and our current target, which is, as the Honourable Member said, inadequate, 30 per cent below 2005 by 2030 is the target left in place by the previous Harper government, and is inconsistent with achieving the Paris Agreement. And again, as my Honourable Colleague said, a carbon price is simply the foundation for action. Where are the eco-energy retrofit programs? Where are those measures that will help Canada's economy transition away from dependency on fossil fuels? So I just wanted to ask the Honourable Member if, if she can, the, the excuse I've heard from the, honor, from the government is that they delayed things like eco-energy retrofit programs in order to make sure that they could be rolled out uh, in, uh, in uh, partnership with the provinces. I, I wonder if the Honourable Member has any comments on that. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member, who of course has worked on this uh, issue tirelessly. Mr. Speaker, what's even greater concern to me is the issue that the member raises. In fact, eco-energy retrofits isn't even on the list of measures that this government is proposing to bring forward. Um, I have spoken with other jurisdictions, and I've had to say specifically in Alberta, they would be delighted if the government started transferring those dollars that are supposed to be happening under the Pan-Canadian Agreement. They have initiated energy efficiency programs, finally, after four decades of the Conservative government refusing to have one. I know that they would welcome an infusion of federal dollars. And the sooner we do that, the sooner we reduce energy use, and the sooner we can get rid of coal-fired power and other major polluting sources of energy. So I would say, Mr. Speaker, to the government through you, bring it on. Let's start uh, uh, delivering those federal dollars and help our burgeoning energy efficiency renewable energy sectors to build and provide jobs and opportunities in Canada.